Well, on June 25th of last year, my home state of West Virginia experienced what they call a thousand year flood, taking the lives of 23 people and destroying the homes and lives of many in its path. Perhaps you remember hearing about it? Anybody remember seeing those pictures on the news? <clears throat> that very day, I was leaving for vacation. My heart was broken and torn. How could I spend a week and enjoy time on the beach with my family when so many were suffering so deeply in a place that's so dear to my heart? Throughout the week, my heart and mind just could not escape the feeling that I belonged back there in that aftermath. The pull I felt was overwhelming. I knew I had to do something. So I stepped out in faith, making a game plan to make a difference. The next week upon returning home, I hit social media with a plea to all my friends, asking them to donate relief supplies so that I could deliver them to the hardest hit areas of my home state. I made contact with a church in West Virginia who was planning to serve in one of the flood zone counties. And I planned my solo trip to the mountains that I love so much. I planned to meet the group and to serve doing whatever I could. So two weeks post flood, I crossed the state line with a car full of relief supplies, an envelope of donated cash, and a heart so full it was overflowing. During my quiet drive all alone, I prayed and I asked God to guide me through what was to come. It was clear I was being caught out of my comfort zone into what actually looked quite like a war zone. I was not fully prepared for what I walked into. My heart was ready to serve, yet my mind struggled to grasp how that much devastation could be caused by water. Simply put, in this case, accumulated raindrops. Something we most never even pause to consider. The power of their combined force is catastrophic, yet at the same time, the power of water can also be a positive agent. Cleansing, hydrating, baptizing. Water at rest results in things left unchanged. The status quo. I'm here to challenge you that we're called to be change agents in this world. We shouldn't be satisfied with status quo. We should stir the waters in our lives until we witness the positive impacts in the world around us. In order to change the world around us, as Christians, our priority should be to live our life in grace. As time passes, we can mature in grace and practice the Christian life through a personal relationship with Jesus. If you fully respond and you're serious about this relationship, then you're called his disciple. Did you realize that the word discipleship never occurs in the Bible? However, Jesus himself defined what discipleship would look like in Luke 14, 25, to 35. One day, when a large group of people were walking along with them, Jesus turned and told them, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go their father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. Is there anyone here who planning to build a new house doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so you'll know if you can complete it? If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun of you. He started something. He couldn't finish. 
Or, can you imagine a king going into battle against another king without first deciding whether it's possible with his 10,000 troops to face the 20,000 troops of the other? And if he decides he can't, won't he sit an emissary and work out a truce? Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. Salt is excellent, but if the salt goes flat, it's useless, good for nothing. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Jesus instructed that this, what discipleship looks like and that it includes a priority relationship with him. Discipleship involves having a purpose. It requires a long-term commitment and a willingness to give up material possessions. One of my favorite music groups is Rim Collective. I love the lyrics from the song The Cost that we just listened to. I've counted up the cost and you're worth it. Before Jesus ever made one disciple, he was the model of a perfect disciple himself. His life on earth is our best example of what a disciple should look like. We need to look no further than Jesus and follow what he modeled during his lifetime here on earth. Because living this way is a mandate from him. He did not leave a list of rules for us to follow. He left examples for us to practice. Jesus didn't tell us to make disciples and leave it, then leave it up to us to define what discipleship looks like. As the great teacher, he did what all good educators know works best. He modeled. He gave us the greatest model to learn from, himself. And in Luke 6.40, he says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. True disciples respond with their whole being to the call of Jesus to follow him and become fishers of people. He beckoned the original twelve by simply stating, follow me. In great faith, they dropped what they were doing and they stepped out to change the history of our world. They were twelve ordinary men, unschooled, possessing no special talents or skills. Let me repeat. He simply said, follow me, and they did. Many think discipleship refers only to these early followers of Christ, but did you realize that God still desires disciples like that today? Ordinary people, just like you and me, who God can use to do extraordinary things. All we need to qualify is to be following Jesus with our own lives, and then be willing to help someone else do the same. I have never worked in a federal disaster area in my, in my life. I had no experience with grief or trauma counseling. I had never interacted with FEMA. That's a nightmare. But I knew in my heart that God equips those that he calls. So I stepped out into those uncertain waters with a belly full of butterflies because I knew that I was definitely being called to wade in deeper. I imagine discipleship to be like tossing a pebble into that steel resting body of water that I mentioned before. Regardless of the force with which it's tossed, there's an impact that's made. Once touched by the pebble, the surface of the water cannot remain the same. Ripples begin from the point of contact. Imagine a dartboard for a minute. The goal in a game of darts is to not just hit the target, but to hit the bullseye. The universal goal is always the same, to hit that bullseye. Our bullseye as disciples is to look like Jesus. That's our goal. The longer we walk with him, the more we should look like him. Like wading into the ocean, he draws us into a deeper experience. Becoming more like Jesus and less like us hitting the center of the bullseye and staying there. Living like Jesus makes an impact on our surrounding world. People see the difference in us and they become curious. And that's where the ripples begin. 
Becoming more like Jesus involves three actions on our behalf. Action one is giving our whole hearts to God. The early disciples had a personal, one-on-one, -on -one, physical relationship with Jesus. They got to eat with Him. They got to talk with Him. They slept with Him. Um, they were with Him one-on-one -on -one every day. They were shaped by that relationship. We, too, must follow suit. All the while understanding that while salvation is free, discipleship will cost us our lives. Jesus put it bluntly in Luke 29, 23 to 25, that when we give our hearts to follow Him wholeheartedly, it means our lives are no longer ours, but His. Discipleship requires a totally committed life in which sacrifice is expected. Action two, we must give our minds to God through study. The early disciples were students Jesus taught them all about God, life, and ministry. The word disciple means to be a learner, a pupil of a master. A disciple listens with attention, drinking in every word of the teacher with an intense desire to apply what has been learned. We should also be students of his word. The Bible acts as our light to highlight right and wrong. It will illuminate our path as we journey through life. It acts as a sword to clean up our lives and to defend us against attacks from Satan. It's our milk and our meat. It's basic nourishment enabling our growth and understanding God and enabling our growth in Him. Throughout our Christian lives, from the time we enter the family of God, Right through the day that we die, we only grow into the people God intends us to be through regular engagement with His Word. Failure to do so means as we grow older, we're growing older, but we're not maturing properly, keeping us from growing as God intends. Spiritual maturity doesn't just show up in the gift box one day. It'd be nice if it did. It takes effort. Learning to obey the scriptures that we study, just as Jesus modeled for us in his own personal time, and that's central to our growth. The Bible is the core ingredient to discipleship. It's our foundation, and without it, discipleship will not be effective. Remove the main ingredient from something, and it will not work. Take the engine from a car, and it's not going to go anywhere. Remove the Bible from a Christian discipleship and no impact will be made. Action three is to give our hands and feet to God through our service and our actions. Dedication to God and the study of His words are not ends in themselves, but they're the beginning steps to prepare us for action as disciples. Discipleship manifests itself in ministry to others. Just as those early disciples were partners with Jesus in his ministry, receiving on-the-job training, Jesus' goal is to partner with us to make us fishers of people. The Gospels and Acts include 260 references to the word disciple. It always refers to a declared relationship with Jesus and not a level of spiritual achievement. Discipleship is the relationship between the teacher and the student. The process of becoming the whole person that God calls each of us to be. This is the way Jesus brought the world to know him. Think about this. During Jesus' relatively short ministry here on earth, it was only three years that he ministered on earth, Jesus converted few people. Kind of sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> Jesus can converted few people when you compare it to the number of people who have con been converted since. Picture Jesus tossing his pebble into the water, making an impact on everybody within the sound of his voice. The resulting ripples continue to resonate and they will continue 
into eternity because of what he did for three short years on earth. What he did was stake his whole earthly ministry on those who would multiply. Jesus was not trying to impress a crowd, but usher in a kingdom. In 2 Timothy, we see that Paul understood how important it was for him to do all that Jesus had commanded and for Jesus to send him out. In the same way, he was sending Timothy to continue the legacy of sending out the faithful who would, in turn, send others. The command that Jesus gave Paul and that Paul gave Timothy is extended to you and I today. And it is as relevant today as it was when he first gave it. When we're submissive to the call of the Lord, even in difficult situations, even when we don't really feel like it, he involves us in a work much greater than we could ever accomplish on our own. Our surrender opens the door for opportunities that will draw us to constantly point to God, our Father. A special moment like this for me on my trip to West Virginia was meeting Gary on the streets of Richwood, West Virginia. My group and I had been busy all morning at the house of one of Gary's neighbors. He was curious about us. He was watching us from afar for a short time. He'd get a little closer and he would watch us. He'd get a little closer and he would watch us. I was at the curb all alone, hauling a nasty wheelbarrow of mud and debris from a basement when Gary approached me. He offered the fact that the church two doors down from where we were working always had its doors open and it had a working restroom, which at that point in the day was a very welcome piece of information. I thanked him and I asked him if that was his church. He acted ashamed to say that it wasn't. And our conversation continued that day until Gary began to cry. Through his sweet tears, he said, what you're doing here is God's purpose. He had a plan for bringing you here. I hope I get to see him one day. This opened a door to a beautiful, tear-filled, spirit-filled conversation about salvation. I realize now that if I had never taken the risk of going to the flood zone, I would have missed that divine appointment that I pray has an eternal impact for Gary. I know it did for me because it was at that moment it was clear to me that we do not have to be a clergy person to be a minister. Ministry is helping people become the whole persons God calls them to be in Jesus Christ. And it's not a part-time activity to be taken lightly. It's our true vocation. Trying to live according to Christ's teaching is a way of life. It's not a solo effort. Though it does take personal action and engagement, it's a group sport. It's best done in a community. No Lone Ranger Christians. God's given each of us various gifts that we all have to offer. Paul constantly talked about the health of the body and how it was impacted by each one of us who uses our God-given gifts. That day, my gifting came in the form of a shovel, a wheelbarrow, and a listening ear. Who knows how far those ripples might reach. No matter the gifts we have, we're called to be a Christian leader. By becoming followers of Jesus, the disciples became leaders among their people. The same is true of present-day disciples. Disciples hear Christ call to step out of the crowd, lead the way. As Christian leaders, we reach out to lead others to a life in grace. Each person here in this room is a leader. Jesus calls you to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are a leader when you use your unique gifts to serve God and others. When you step out in faith, you learn that it's a lifelong process which results in changes in your values. Once you accept Jesus, your priorities definitely change. Your attitudes are altered, 
and your behaviors that once were characteristic of you are no longer a part of your life. When you become a new creation in Christ, you can't remain the same and truly live for Him. These changes result in ministry in the world around you. Christian leadership is not based on the power of position, but on the authority of love and the commitment to the truth. The style of Christian leadership is servanthood. And believe me, the world notices servanthood when they see it. As a disciple, there are certain natural qualities we possess. The first is that we know our priority. A disciple's priority sets the course of our lives, gives direction, and challenges the disciple to live up to their potential. Disciples are not just students of Jesus, but they're followers of Jesus, making him the number one priority. In Luke 14, 26, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own mother and father and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We see Jesus use the word hate. He does so to signify a lesser level of devotion. Disciples of Jesus must love him more than any other person. Disciples, disciples must love with a passionate love that results itself in everyday life. How do we grow our love for Christ into a passion? It grows out of time spent together. While on earth, Jesus modeled for us that intimacy with the Father and what it looks like by taking time to be alone with Him. Even though His days were full, just like ours are, He made the Father the focal point of every day. Time with God results in changed thinking and changed behavior. Jesus called his disciples salt and light. Salt and light make a difference where they're applied. Quality two is a disciple has discipline. Discipleship involves accepting the dis discipline to follow Christ each day and hour. It means living in God's presence continually and using one's gifts in ministry. Church participation is a discipline, giving your presence, your prayers, your gifts and service. As disciples, we must examine our thoughts, examine our words, and our actions, and we need to compare those to God's Word. This requires daily that we're in the Word studying, praying over it, and often the difficult step of obeying it. Jesus modeled spending time in scripture and prayer. With Jesus as our model, maturity and discipleship will be the mark of our lives. And our third quality, a disciple knows reality. A disciple is keenly aware of their surroundings, the people and the circumstances in their lives. A disciple has a clear head and a warm heart and both feet on the ground. Disciples realize that the persons they meet each day are the ones God is giving them to witness to. He's called each of us to the mission field called life. We're all surrounded by people who need to be impacted by the gospel in our workplace, in the doctor's office, in our schools, at dinner, and in our own homes. We're not called to be a missionary, not all of us, to Haiti or Cambodia, but we are called to the equally important role to reach people in our lives right where we are. God has put us where we are for a reason. When we truly believe that our actions will impact the spiritual development of others, it will change the way we live. We're responsible before God to be involved in discipleship for ourselves and for others. And the fourth quality is a discipleship's empathy. Identifying with other persons both in their sorrow and their joy. Genuine appreciation of the gifts and experiences of others is characteristic of Christian leadership. As disciples, we should be active in service and evangelism. Again, you don't have to go to a third world country to serve and evangelize. Service can be as simple as buying a coffee for your coworker, caring for the needy who may be hurting physically or spiritually, or listening to a friend in confidence. 
Evangelism is spreading the gospel, whether it's by a public speech or in a quiet personal witness. Sometimes our actions speak louder than our words. Recently, a high school friend told me about an experience he had in that particular day where he lives in Florida. This is Joe's story. I was standing at the gas pumps, and the guy next to me was on the phone speaking in a tone of desperation. He kept saying, but please, my children, please, I won't be able to provide for them. It was heartbreaking. He slid down his car, cried softly but openly. I stood in shock for a moment and watched as people walked past him, walked over, knelt beside him, and I asked him if he could use a drink of water. He said, I could use prayers more than water. I said, let's pray. He was stunned, and he laid his head on my shoulder. We began to pray. Two other men joined. It was one of the most genuine moments God's allowed me to witness. The man told us he was released from jail six weeks ago and had found work as a carpenter for a construction company. He said he has four kids ranging from one year to six years. His boss fired him because he was late for work today. He said his wife had been very sick for two weeks and he had to drop his son off for his first day at school today because she was admitted to the hospital at 2.15 this morning. This man looked beaten, broken, and just ready to quit. One of the men who stopped to pray with us took the man's hand, stood him up, and hugged him and said, You are my brother, and you are home. Let's go to work. The man then offered him a job on the spot, told him he would pay him $5 more an hour than what he was making, and handed him a fist full of money. The man told him, your first assignment is to go and take care of your family and show up at the office next Monday. I'm paying you for this week. The troubled man cried so loud he was shaking he could not stand. Why? And the good disciple answered, because I've been down and out. And a man I did not know gave me a chance. He died for me and he asked me to love my brother. And you are my brother. My life took a different path that day than I anticipated. I am so moved and better because it did. God allowed me to witness this power through others. I saw his hands and feet. Can't imagine how far the ripples will travel from that pebble hitting the water. I know it impacted the people involved, but hearing Joe's story impacted me. And then I shared it with my family, and it impacted them. And now, I share it with you. The ripples continue. This experience shows how a disciple should be a self-starter, sizing up a need and taking steps to meet it, living with your eyes open, looking ahead for ways to serve others, and seeing every situation as an opportunity for witness. Initiative and sacrifice was obvious in my experience in serving in West Virginia. The group I work with chose to give up their week of church camp and use that week to assist in flood relief. All the money they had invested and raised through car washes and bake sales in order to go to camp was instead used to purchase hazmat suits, work gloves, and other necessities for the job at hand. They saw a need and they took steps to meet it. Another group with initiative and meeting needs was our sponsoring group at a church that was local to the flood zone in which we served. The members of that youth group also gave up the money they raised to travel to church camp. And they used it to house us in their church gym, to feed us three meals a day for an entire week, and to provide worship and study services each night. The actions of these modern day disciples are like the continuation of the book of Acts. Through each of us, the acts of the apostles continue to unfold. The story of the Holy Spirit acting through the lives of ordinary people who live and act out of gratitude for all that God has given and will continue to give. A disciple is blessed to be a blessing, gladly exhibiting toward others the generosity he or she's experienced from God. As one person has said, 
Evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. A disciple does not withhold the living bread from a starving world. I was overwhelmed by the generosity of my friends and my Mount Nebo church family who donated relief supplies and a total of $2,300 to be used to help aid flood victims that I encountered, allowing me to buy food and provisions for those who had lost everything. My vehicle full of relief supplies was a visual representation of all that had been given. Through the simple action of my friends donating a few dollars or supplies, I was able to reach people in their most desperate hour of need. And the love of Jesus resounded from something as simple as a bottle of bleach or a case of water. Jesus never asked us to do anything that he hadn't already done. He ministered to others by sharing God's love and building disciples. With Jesus as our model, generosity will just come naturally. Through the Holy Spirit, God gives his disciples certain spiritual qualities of his gifts of grace. With these qualities, disciples demonstrate Christ in their lives. People in our lives are watching us, and before they do what we ask, they watch what we do. Remember, your talk talks. Your walk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Let me say that one more time. Your talk talks. Your walk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. The way you live speaks volumes about disciple making. People want to hear what we have to say when they watch how we interact with others. No one wants to hear what you have to say before they see that you are loving. They're watching and waiting, just like Gary was. We can help unbelievers become believers by showing them Christ. The poem Sermons We See by Edward Ge Edgar Guess is a fantastic illustration. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes of better people and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples are always clear. And best of all preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. In the Gospels, we read about two types of people who illustrate for us the difference between the knowing of someone and really knowing someone. The crowds, the thousands of people who sought out Jesus, they were hungry and they wanted healing, but most were just curious and not committed. Then there are the disciples, those few who heard the call to follow, they committed their lives to him and they put their faith in action. The same two types of people exist in today's church. Each of us must decide which we will be. Will we, will we stop short of fully responding to God's grace and his call and will grasp our pebbles and hold them tightly in our fist? Or will we gratefully and wholeheartedly respond by becoming disciples of Jesus Christ and toss our pebbles at every opportunity that is presented. Jesus gave the command, follow me, and the promise, I will equip you to find others to follow me. 
The Great Commission applies to every Christian, and He has promised to be with us in our efforts. We were made to be disciples, and it takes one to make one. The ultimate investment that you can make with your life is by investing it in something that will outlast it. Jesus invested His life in 12 men for three years. Now, 2,000 years later, look at His return. Just think of investing your life in others for the remainder of your years. Imagine the resounding ripples that would make it and move through eternity. Perhaps you feel more like part of that crowd than you feel like a disciple. That's okay. Because even though you can't change the path you have been on, you can change where you are headed. And the impact of our few years on this earth can continue to draw dividends for thousands of years. That's an eternal investment. They probably won't know who you were, but that doesn't matter because they'll know who Jesus is. I've heard it said that the two most important days of our lives are the day we were born and the day we understand why we were born. I want my, to make my life count for the things that count. I want what I do on a daily basis to make a difference in eternity. I want to toss as many pebbles as possible. It's amazing to realize that we are Jesus' plan to reach the world. He has no other plan. It's us. Let's do what he said when he commanded, go and make disciples. Let's make ripples that impact eternity. Before we leave today, I want to give you a moment to kind of process all that God has taught us. If you can, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you can't, that's okay. And I want you to meditate on the following questions. Where do you find yourself today? Do you know Jesus? as your personal Savior? If you've not accepted Him yet, that's the first step. And now is the perfect time to give your heart to Him. It's so simple. Almost so simple that it seems hard to believe. All you need to do is respond to His call. That tugging you might feel in your heart, that's Him inviting you to be His friend. That's Him asking you to let Him carry your burdens, and forgive you of your sin. Don't be afraid or embarrassed to come forward, and we'll pray with you. I promise it will be the best decision of your life. You can walk out those doors today a new creation with a new DNA. It will help you see hope where you see, now see despair, joy where you now feel sorrow, and peace that will replace fear and anxiety and stress. Jesus is offering you a new life in Him today. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. This message may have been just for you for this day because now is your time. We're here to help you and pray with you. We'll introduce you to our best friend Jesus. Maybe you already know Jesus as your Savior. Are you holding tight to your pebbles? Are you hiding them in your pocket, hoping that no one notices? Are you fearful of tossing that pebble because you're afraid of what might re be required or how others would react? If this is you, you can change your course of action today by committing to make an impact with your gifts, your talents, and your resources. By deciding to live out loud, tossing your pebbles, and making eternal ripples by reaching those in the mission field of your life. If this is you, come and let's pray together for the next steps that God is calling you into. Let's join together in believing that He will not leave us alone to do what He calls us to do. He will be with us in it all. Let's pray together for faith 
and for all of us to join together as a community of believers who want to make an impact. Maybe you're living a life full of study and discipleship. You're taking advantage of every opportunity to toss your pebbles and make ripples. If you are, sometimes that can be emotionally and physically draining. Do you need some refreshing, some renewal to be re-energized so you can continue along the path God has you walking? Sometimes that walk can be a lonely one. Do you just need to feel the support of your fellow disciples? If so, come and let's pray for new strength, an energized spirit, and eyes to see where he's calling us. Let's pray together for a strengthened sense of community where we can lean on each other and him on our walk together. Where two or more are gathered, God is in the midst. Surely one of these describes where you find yourself this morning. Shake off whatever is holding you back and come meet with Jesus. He's asked us to bring all of our burdens to Him. And He's waiting for us.